Welcome back to part two of our double podcast episode about Mildred Fish Harnack, the US born woman at the heart of the German resistance to Nazism. If you haven't listened to part one yet, I'd go back and listen to that first. Alla mattina, appena alzata, oh bella ciao, bella ciao, bella ciao, 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 alla mattina. We left off last time with Mildred Fischhanak, her husband Arvid, and their resistance circle organizing in Berlin. First and foremost, they considered themselves anti-fascists. But when it became clear that they were unable to inspire a mass movement to topple Hitler, they began supplying valuable intelligence to rival governments, particularly the Soviet Union. To this aim, the circle agreed to take radio transmitters to be able to send encrypted messages to Moscow. But this led to a catalogue of mishaps, which were the result of a pre-ragtag, untrained bunch of anti-fascists attempting to get involved in the high-tech and complex world of espionage. So Moscow Center sent radio transmitters to this Berlin group and um, hastily trained several members of the circle to operate these radio transmitters. And mistakes were made in sending enciphered messages to um, Moscow Center. Um, there were also problems with the radio transmitters themselves. Uh, one blew up when one of the operators plugged it into um the wrong plug. Uh, also, another person dropped um, one of these transmitters and somebody else had to come and repair it. And, and it was just, it, it was one mishap after another and involving these radio transmitters. And another problem was that they had to encipher these messages um, that they would send to Moscow Center via the uh, radio transmitters. And this was a very painstaking process to encipher. Um, and Mildred was involved in enciphering as well as other members of the group. Uh, so they worked long hours through the night. It was exhausting. There was a constant fear that the Gestapo would, would track them down. Even operating one of these radio transmitters exposed you to arrest. Um, and so amidst all of this, uh, the Gestapo was attempting to intercept these messages. Eventually, German military intelligence, the Abwehr, was able to do just that. On June 26, 1941, Abwehr agents intercepted an enciphered message from a shortwave radio transmitter. And they didn't know what this was, but they forwarded this message to the Funk Abwehr, which is the signals intelligence branch of the Abwehr that was dedicated to monitoring illicit broadcasts and deciphering signals from the Allies. Um, these agents only worked a few blocks from Mildred and Arvid's apartment. They, they couldn't determine where the message came from uh, or who the intended recipient was. And then two months later, they intercepted a second message. And this was, again, still enciphered. They didn't know yet what it said, but it, it named three people in, in the resistance group. Um, and it included their addresses and there were instructions um, for the recipient of this message to basically seek out these three people in this underground resistance group and to basically try to figure out why they stopped receiving messages. And of course, they stopped receiving these messages because the radio transmitters had broken and there were difficulties in transmitting. But what's important to understand is that now the Funk Abwehr had intercepted this message with the names of three people in a resistance group, and it included their real names, not their code names, and their addresses. And now this was an Espionage 101 failure. You do not send, even if it's an enciphered message, as they all were, you do not send the actual names of the people. You do not, uh, you use their code names. And worse, their names and their addresses were revealed in this message. This mistake was the kind of thing that experienced intelligence operatives would never have done. But the experienced NKVD officers in Berlin had mostly been executed in the Great Purge, and they'd been replaced by relative rookies. And it was a mistake that would prove fatal to many. And so it was just a matter of time before the Funk Abwehr cryptologists deciphered this message and the Gestapo cast their net and 
began to arrest everyone in the group, beginning with those three. One of those three was Arvid, and uh, another one was Haro Schultzeboysen. And Haro was the first person who was arrested. Haro Schultzeboysen was arrested on August 31st, 1942. His wife, Libertas, found out and tried to warn as many members of the group as possible. So Mildred and Arvid actually fled, and uh, they planned to escape to Sweden. And a high-ranking SS officer named Horst Kopko basically pursued them and discovered them in Nazi-occupied Lithuania. And they were arrested and led back to Berlin and thrown into the basement prison at Gestapo headquarters. And in the weeks that followed, they would find that that basement uh, prison would fill with all their friends in the resistance. Mildred Narvid's arrest was one of the scenes in the book told in the most detail, due to circumstances which were very fortunate for Rebecca as a writer. We know about the arrest because Mildred and Arvid were staying with a historian who was their friend, Egmont Zeklin, and his wife, Annalisa. And Egmont wrote about this arrest after the war. And it's a, it's a long article that he wrote and published. And in it, he actually includes dialogue. <laughs> um, it's not just uh, the account of a historian. It's almost like the account of a novelist. And he describes moment by moment what this Gestapo officer said and what this other Gestapo officer said and what Arvid said in response. And, and so, you know, as, as a writer, this was solid gold to me because I was able to describe in, in great detail the moment of Mildred and Arvid's arrest. While Mildred and Arvid didn't give up any names, some of those arrested did. And soon, 119 people associated with the circle were rounded up. 119 men and women in this group were arrested and thrown in prison. And pretty soon the Gestapo basement prison filled to capacity. And so the men were sent off to the men's prisons and the women were sent off to the women's prisons. As we mentioned right at the beginning of these episodes, this group of defendants became known by a new name. And it was not a name that they used among themselves, uh, but it was a, a name that was given to them by the German intelligence which called their group the Red Orchestra. And this is a name that some people are familiar with today who are familiar with this group. Um, essentially, uh, the German intelligence used the word orchestra to describe any espionage network. And when they discovered that Mildred's group was sending coded messages to Moscow, they, they called the orchestra Red. Mildred was sent to a women's prison and put in solitary confinement. And she was not allowed to read a book, uh, to write a letter, uh, to write anything. Um, and Arvid was given these privileges and, and other members of the group were, in fact, but Mildred was not. She was interrogated every day as the others, uh, many others in the group were as well. And she was tortured as many others were. Her torturer was Walter Habecker, who was this sadistic Nazi who was renowned for his brutal torture techniques. And in fact, several members of her group committed suicide when they learned that they would be interrogated by Habecker. Despite the terrible conditions and an environment which is probably about the most repressive one you can imagine, a Gestapo prison in Nazi Germany, Mildred and her friends still found ways to resist. Mildred was prohibited, to, as I said, to write letters. The prisoners were also prohibited from communicating or talking at all. Every day they would go into the prison yard and they would have a very short time to sort of basically walk around its perimeter and then they would be thrown back into their cells. And during this walk, um, this was an occasion for notes to be passed. Um, they're called Kassiber and they're basically, these notes were really among my most significant archival discoveries. Sometimes they slip these notes to each other during that walk. Sometimes they would hide them in the broken mortar between bricks or in the cracks and fissures of the walls for other prisoners to find. These notes were strictly prohibited at the prison. Guards were paid for each one of these notes they confiscated. And the prisoners were punished severely if they were caught passing them or writing them. Um, and in fact, Mildred had been writing Somehow she got her hand on, on a pencil stub and, and paper, and she had been caught writing and passing them to Libertas Schulzeboysen, who was also uh, the only other member of their group who was kept at this particular women's prison in Berlin. Um, and the notes were confiscated, and these were 
used against Mildred in a trial uh, that the Nazi authorities were planning uh, for this group. And they were very inventive in how they found ways to communicate. The cussive or these notes, sometimes they would sew them in the garments of their, uh, of their clothing. I found it quite interesting that one way that the prison saved money was to require the families to come and pick up their prisoners, that the, whatever uh, member of their family was incarcerated, they would pick up the dirty laundry of that prisoner and take them home and launder them, um, the, the laundry, and then bring it back. And of course, this became uh, an ideal way of passing notes back and forth. And so um, this is why we have these notes today, actually. Uh, so family members would save these notes. And sometimes these notes were like little prose poems and about what the light looked like uh, on the wall of the prison. And sometimes women would describe their the forced labor that they had to do, making fabric flowers, uh, uh, boxes and boxes and boxes of them. Some of their notes would be just gossip, but some were a way of communicating information about their upcoming trials, about interrogations, about different guards, who they should look out for, who they should avoid, and so on. While the women passed notes, Rebecca's research uncovered a way that the imprisoned men communicated. They developed um, in this group a kind of a knock language. It's sort of like a Morse code. And this is how they communicated. One member, Gunter Weissenborn, talks about this explicitly, uh, writes about this in his memoir. He was one of the survivors. And it's fascinating how basically he and his co-conspirators were able to communicate with each other and pass information about interrogators about um, evidence that was discovered and, and this, they would basically communicate with this knock language and, and try to help each other survive. Eventually, all 119 prisoners were to be put on trial en masse for treason. The mass treason trial was to be held at the Reich Court Martial, the Reichskriegsgericht, which was a, an organ of the high command of the armed forces. And three high-ranking military officers and two civilian judges uh, formed a panel, and they would determine the innocence or guilt of the defendants uh, who stood before them. Mildred was one of those defendants, and uh, which was unusual because typically the people who would show up in court at the Reich Court Martial were soldiers who were charged with desertion or generals who were charged with insubordination. Um, but Mildred and her co-conspirators were, with one exception, Harry schulz um, they, they were not military officers. Um, they were civilians, but they were all charged with treason. And there are two kinds of treason that German criminal law recognizes. There's treason against the government, uh, Hochverrat, and treason against the country, which was uh, Landsverrat. A defendant who was found guilty of treason against the government was punished with a prison sentence. And a defendant who was convicted of treason against the country was punished with death. So the, the mass trial was essentially set up to determine which form of treason these people in the resistance were guilty of. And Goering uh, handpicked a prosecutor for this mass trial. His name was Manfred Rode. He was nicknamed by his colleagues Hitler's bloodhound. And over the course of three and a half months, he compiled transcripts of all of these interrogations in these binders to be used as evidence against Mildred and her co-conspirators. And by December 1942, there were 30 binders. So there was a tremendous amount of evidence against Mildred and her co-conspirators. And um, there were 19 separate trials planned for about 75 of them. The trial began in December 1942, and its result was basically a foregone conclusion. At the first trial, Mildred, after three and a half months of being locked in a solitary cell, she walked into a courtroom and she saw Arvid for the first time um, in three and a half months. And she saw Haro Schulze-Boysen and Libertas Schulze-Boysen and a number of others in their group. And they were all convicted of treason. Mildred was given a prison sentence. Arvid and the others were given death sentences. So Mildred's life was spared. And 
The transcripts from the trial were destroyed by the Nazis. And so we don't know exactly why, but it, uh, we do have the sentencing document that did survive. Mildred's nationality and the sexism of the judges contributed to a different verdict in her case to everyone else. And so it, it's pretty clear from this document that the panel of judges determined that Mildred, because she was an American and also because she was just a wife and she didn't know what her husband was doing and, and also that she was a scholar and loved German literature and admired Goethe, uh, she would be given some leniency. And this is what the sentencing document indicates. Um, Mildred successfully argued that she knew nothing and that she was just a wife, but of course that was just a a defence strategy. In a normal court case, after you get the verdict, you can process it and then try and move on with your life. But political trials in Nazi Germany were not normal, and everything was subject to the whims of the dictator, Adolf Hitler. Two days later, Hitler looked at the report of this uh, trial and saw that Mildred Harnock had not been given the death penalty and was outraged and ordered a reversal. And so Mildred underwent a second trial and she was found guilty, uh, but this time she was given a death sentence. And so on February 16th, 1943, at Plötensee Prison in Berlin, Mildred Harnock was strapped to a guillotine and beheaded. Mildred was 40 years old. The other members of her group, the men were either hanged or shot, and Arvid was among them. He was hanged. Uh, And the women, like Mildred, were decapitated by guillotine. People are often surprised to learn of the Nazis' use of the guillotine, but they were big proponents of the device, executing over 16,000 people with it, including Mildred and other resistance activists like Sophie and Hans Scholl. Some people on the left glorify the guillotine due to its famous application against aristocrats during the French Revolution. But in France, the new revolutionary government soon began using it against those to their left. And France used the guillotine widely in its colonies, as well as domestically, where the last person executed by guillotine was a Tunisian agricultural worker convicted of murder, who was beheaded in 1977. In 1871, during the socialist uprising known as the Paris Commune, Mutinous National Guard troops seized the local guillotine, smashed it to pieces and burned it to the applause of onlookers, who saw the guillotine as a sign of capitalist authority and brutality. Back in Berlin, the Nazis were not just content to take Mildred's life. Rebecca's book recounts how after the war, Arvid Harnack's niece, Margareta, was studying to be a doctor at the University of Berlin. And one day, one of her professors said he needed to return something to her family. He gave Margareta a vase. The vase contained Mildred's ashes, and the professor claimed that he saved Mildred from being dissected. Margareta was so grateful for what he'd done, until decades later, she found out it was a lie. The head of the anatomical department at the University of Berlin had a secret arrangement with the director of Plötensee Prison to deliver women's bodies to his laboratory, where he dissected them to investigate the effects of stress on their reproductive organs. His name was Dr. Hermann Steve, and he kept a list of the women who he dissected, and Mildred was on this list, as were many others in her group. 182 women were on that list, including number 84, Mildred Harnack, and number 37, Libertas Schulze-Boysen. Nearly 80 years later, the stories of these women are still being written. I can also mention that the microscopic remains of some of these women were discovered uh, recently. And in 2019, actually, an article in The Guardian reported on a ceremony um, where basically these microscopic remains were given a proper burial. And the New York Times subsequently picked up that story as well. So the story of, of the women in this resistance is still developing. We're still finding out more about them. As listeners will be aware, Germany eventually lost World War II, and after the conflict ended, the anti-fascist, democratic allies set about investigating Nazi war crimes. One of the cases investigated was that of Mildred Fischharnack. In 
1998, under a mandate from the Nazi War Crimes Disclosure Act, the CIA and the FBI and the U.S. Army began to release records that were once classified as top secret. And this process continues to this day. Um, MI6 has done the same. And we, and we now have conclusive evidence that Mildred Harnock's involvement in the underground German resistance was viewed through a Cold War lens. As early as 1946, a, an officer with um, uh, the CIC, which was a sort of a predecessor of the CIA, evaluated Mildred Harnock's case and concluded that her execution by guillotine was justified, which I found astonishing that we have an American official who's, who's saying that an American woman who tried to uh, fight the Nazi regime was justified in having her head chopped off to be crude. Not only that, but Mildred had even been a US asset, supplying German intelligence to the US government through her contact at the embassy. But the US government seemed to be more keen on the German torturers and murderers than on an anti-fascist US citizen. In researching this story and in, in looking at British and US uh, intelligence files, I discovered that immediately after the war, British and U.S. intelligence recruited a number of high-ranking German officials in Hitler's regime, and and that two of these Germans were directly involved in arresting, prosecuting, torturing, and executing Mildred. So one of them was Hitler's bloodhound, um, the Reichskriegsgericht prosecutor, uh, otherwise known as Manfred Rode, and he was just on the verge of being indicted as a war criminal in Nuremberg in 1947 when the U.S. Army's uh, counterintelligence corps whisked him away to a top secret intellig- um, at location and disguised his identity with the code name Othello and basically interviewed him. For an extended period of time, they were under the impression that Manfred Rode possessed a wealth of information that could be valuable to the United States about Soviet espionage techniques. And, and actually, Rode fed the CIC this fiction that Mildred and her co-conspirators had been members of a massive communist espionage ring that was still alive and active in the United States and posed a, a threat to the United States. As World War II ended, many governments were keen to recruit Nazis to work for him especially as rivalry between the West and the USSR began re-emerging right away. Most famously, the US government launched Operation Paperclip. Originally dubbed Operation Overcast, it was a plan to make use of German technology in order to rival the Soviet Union. Through the plan, around 1,600 Nazi technicians largely avoided war crimes prosecution and were brought to the US to work on projects like the space program and on the notorious MKUltra mind control experiments. Similarly, the USSR recruited Nazi scientists with their Operation Ossovirkim. After implementing a very half-hearted denazification process, West Germany quickly reinstalled many former Nazis in positions of power. To illustrate just how half-hearted this was, out of around 1 million people involved in the Holocaust, only around 600 of them received life imprisonment or death sentences. Even convicted war criminals like Hans Martin Schleyer rapidly regained power, Schleyer himself quickly became president of Germany's main employer association, helping to break strikes and workers' organization. Incidentally, the chickens only eventually came home to roost for Schleyer when he was killed by the urban guerrilla group the Red Army Faction, but that's a story for another day. Similar to the US, with its own anti-communist paranoia, the UK was also keen to engage former Nazis as new Cold War allies. British intelligence was likewise duped by the Nazi who personally arrested Mildred Harnock and presided over her torture. Right after, in 1945, Horst Kopko was arrested and he told his British captors that he could provide valuable information about this sprawling communist espionage ring that included Russian plots against British interests. So MI6 agents responded by faking his death and they gave him a new identity as the manager of a textile factory in West Germany, and they gave him the name Peter Cordes. Um, so neither Manfred Roder or Horst Kopko faced trial at Nuremberg. This kind of information about Britain and the US are best ignoring, or at worst betraying the German resistance, and cozying up to the Nazis who helped crush it, is most likely a major reason the German resistance isn't spoken about much in these countries today. Another factor could be that mainstream narratives, both on the political right as well as much of the left, 
like to talk about historical conflicts as being conflicts between nation states. This approach completely neglects the often much more significant conflicts within nations themselves, between different classes and other groups. World War II is a good example of this. In the US and UK, the conventional narrative is that they fought for democracy against the unacceptable evils of German Nazism, Italian fascism and Japanese imperialism. The reality was very different, as Britain at that point still possessed a vast empire which was not particularly democratic, seeing that it was made of numerous undemocratic white supremacist dictatorships which used concentration camps both before and after the war. And Western governments had no issues with fascism as such. Even figures painted as legendary anti-fascists, like British Prime Minister Winston Churchill, openly declared his, quote, wholehearted support of the fascism of Benito Mussolini in Italy as a solution for, quote, the bestial appetites and passions, end quote, of communism. As we discussed in detail in our episodes 39 and 40 about the Spanish Civil War, both the US and UK effectively supported General Francisco Franco and the fascists in their war against the democratically elected Republican government by blockading the Republic while enabling and sometimes directly providing supplies to Franco. And after the war for democracy was declared over, the dictatorship in Spain, as well as the Estado Novo over the border in Portugal, remained intact for decades. The fascist Axis powers only became a problem when they threatened Western geopolitical interests. In addition to the history of the German resistance being sidelined, as with most history, the role of women within it has been sidelined even further. Well, as I like to point out, um, the scholar Claudia Coombs has observed that many historians writing about the German resistance downplay, marginalize, or entirely ignore women's participation. Historians writing about the Red Orchestra typically name Arvid Harnock or Haro schulze boysen or both of them as a leader, um, and either ignore Mildred entirely or mention her merely as Arvid's wife. The students who Mildred recruited into the resistance are not referred to as Mildred's recruits. They're referred to as Arvid's recruits, Arvid's contacts. Arvid is presented as presiding over the meetings of this group um, with Mildred as a kind of silent partner. But in fact, according to the archives, um, beginning in 1935, she led most of the meetings when Arvid began working at the Ministry of Economics. So uh, these are just some examples, but nearly all accounts of the group focus on the men. And I found this post-war U.S. intelligence file on the group uh, where you see the, the names of the people in the group. And it's, it's one column is their name and, and then the other column is their profession. So all the men, you know, uh, are are listed according to their pro- uh, either, you know, Haro schulze boysen is listed as being an officer in the Luftwaffe, and Arvid Harnock is listed as being uh, a senior official at the Ministry of Economics, and uh, so on. Um, and the women are all wives. So even though Mildred was a scholar and taught at the University of Berlin, she is just a wife. There are other professors and, and authors who are women, and, and they also are listed as wife, just wife. And, and so you can see a kind of a bias, right, in this U.S. intelligence document about the role that women played in this group. They were just supporters. They didn't even have a profession of their own. In addition to this kind of distortion and bias in the documentation, some historians also just made sexist assumptions about Mildred and repeated them as fact. In terms of Mildred specifically, the historian David Dolan in his book, Soviet Espionage in 1955, describes Mildred, and I'm quoting, as essentially a non-political person interested only in literature and languages. (laughs) Um, And Heinz Hohne uh, in 1970, in, in his book about the Red Orchestra, says, and I quote, as a wife, Mildred followed her husband's line. She was basically non-political. Uh, there was another author, Gilles Perrault, a French author who just fetishized Mildred in his book about the Red Orchestra and describes her gleaming blonde hair and, and, and then makes a bunch of factual errors about her, including uh, he describes her as walking up to climbing the scaffold to be hanged um, when, you know, she was not hanged at all. She was decapitated by guillotine. But these are important details. And I think that you can see how over the years, you know, from one decade to the next, there are these misapprehensions about Mildred, uh, about 
crucial facts about how she died um, and about her essential uh, role in this group and also about her motivations. And she was clearly a political person uh, and she had very strong political views and she was a primary recruiter of people. Um, she was able to, again, under the guise of a, of a professor, of an American literature professor, she was very effective at recruiting Germans into the resistance. But here she is treated by historians as a non-political person who was standing by her husband's side. Even brilliant and well-meaning historians have brushed over Mildred's role. In 2008, the British historian Richard Evans wrote that women played a particularly prominent role in the underground resistance. And then he actually explicitly mentions Mildred. He says, notably Harnock's American wife, Mildred Harnock Fish. And then he goes on to ignore her contributions entirely. So he doesn't really explain how she played this particularly prominent role. And we are left to just guess. And so one of my aims in writing this book was to provide the details that are missing from accounts like Richard Evans's account. Uh, he does acknowledge that she played this prominent role, but he doesn't tell us how. And so with my access to family archives, my access to her letters and other documents, um, and with my extensive archival research, I, in this book, was able to provide a very full explanation about how Mildred was not only a member of this group, but according to all available records, she was the only American, man or woman, in the leadership of the German underground resistance during the Nazi regime. Rebecca being Mildred's great-great-niece and having access to family archives is one of the reasons All the Frequent Troubles of Our Days is such a fantastic book. She told me how she first found out about Mildred and her life, at the age of 16, at her grandmother's house. I was at her house in Chevy Chase, Maryland, and she produced a, a pile of books, actually. They were Mildred's books, and, and they had her, her name on the flyleaf. And then she gave me the letters, uh, and then she told me about a little boy who was 11 years old when he was Mildred's courier, an American boy whose father was uh, a diplomat at the U.S. Embassy in Berlin. And uh, his name was Don Heath. And she told me that between 1939 and 1941, he, um, his parents had worked out an arrangement with Mildred and Arvid Harnock, using him as a courier to pass information from the Harnocks to his father at the U.S. Embassy in Berlin. And so I tracked him down uh, when he was 89 years old. And he told me quite a bit about Mildred's involvement in espionage. Rebecca's grandmother had even been a witness to some of Mildred's resistance activity, although she didn't realise it at the time. My grandmother was 21 when she decided to go to Berlin and stay with Mildred. And this was in 1937, um, quite a time to go to Germany for a while and, and um, as an American. And so while Mildred was continuing her work in the resistance, uh, Jane, my grandmother, basically went on picnics with her and went to concerts with her and never suspected that a lot of these social gatherings were occasions for passing information, top secret intelligence that Mildred's husband, Arvid, had, had obtained from the Ministry of Economics about Hitler's operational and, and military strategies. Since then, Writing the book about Mildred's life has been something that Rebecca just had to do. You know, when my grandmother gave me Mildred's letters when I was 16, that was the first moment uh, when I thought I should write this book. In fact, she explicitly said to me, you must write this book one day. She knew that I wanted to be a writer and that I wanted to write big books. And she thought this would be a worthy topic of a big book. And then I began researching the book off and on um, over the course of many years. But really, I knew that I did not want this to be my first book. Uh, it was too much of a heavy lift. And, and I knew that I had to get a few books under my belt and really have a sense of, uh, I wanted this book to be a very big book. And the scope of my ambitions were very large. And so I waited until the moment was right to me. Um, after my second book was published, I found myself in Berlin 
And I visited the Gedenkstätte Deutsche Widerstand, the German Resistance Memorial Center. And that was the moment that, that was sort of the second moment for me when I thought, all right, I'm getting ready to write this book. And I met with the head of the center and asked if I could gain access to um, the primary source documents there. And, and, and he said, yes, of course. Um, and then I decided instead of writing this book, I would write an, another book um, because I still wasn't quite ready. Uh, it seemed too formidable a topic, at least at that very moment in time. Current events finally convinced Rebecca that now was the right time for the book to be written. So I was reading around the German resistance and sort of gathering information, but really I began in earnest to visit archives and to start writing the manuscript in 2016 in the run-up to the presidential election. And I, at that moment, thought resistance was in the zeitgeist. Uh, we have somebody running for president who posed a threat, and um, and I thought, I, I want people to know about Mildred and this group of Germans in the underground resistance who risked and indeed lost their lives fighting a bully, fighting a fascist dictator. I, I felt that people could gain some kind of not only just um, an intellectual understanding of what happened in, in Germany and uh, gain an understanding of the stories of people who's, uh, you know, we haven't heard many of their stories before. And unfortunately, I think that the recognition that many Germans supported the Nazi regime tends to silence the stories of those who, who opposed it. So I felt that it was time for people to hear these stories. And my hope was that people could also find themselves inspired and even emboldened in hearing them. Democracy is fragile, and I think that that is something that really we we need to understand and appreciate. And, I, and the storming of the Capitol on, on January 6th, I think people started to understand on a visceral level how that this attempted insurrection, that this was possible. Uh, luckily, the guardrails stayed up, but that was, I think, a defining moment for people in this country and I think that, and, and I have heard from readers who uh, cite that as an event that has, even today, they're still, it's, it's, they're very fearful of what could happen here. And they've said it was very useful for them to read in my book about how Germany progressed from a parliamentary democracy to a fascist dictatorship. And certainly the circumstances are different. I'm not saying that there is a one-to-one uh, -one correlation at all um, between sort of then and now, but people are connecting certain ideas and, and certainly uh, the idea that we cannot take democracy for granted is something that I have heard from readers over and over again. On the 6th of January, 2020, Thousands of supporters of far-right Republican President Donald Trump stormed the U.S. Capitol building in an attempt to overturn the results of the election, which Trump lost by over 7 million votes. The crowd included many white supremacists and neo-Nazis, people waving Nazi flags, pro-slavery Confederate flags, and people wearing t-shirts celebrating the Auschwitz concentration camp and declaring that the 6 million Jewish people exterminated in the Holocaust, quote, wasn't enough. While it's tempting to dismiss the event as laughable and a joke led by incompetent weirdos, shamans and the like, they did have powerful allies in the government. And as time goes on, more and more revelations have emerged about how there was a genuine coup plot from within the administration, with executive orders drafted ordering the seizure of voting machines and so on. And in Congress, despite the crowd clearly wanting to kidnap and murder some of their colleagues, the majority of Republican representatives then voted to overturn the results of the election. In the end, serious civil disorder was probably only avoided by the far-right Christian supremacist Vice President Mike Pence refusing to exceed his authority and overturn the election. It was a close call and a timely reminder that liberal democracy is not as stable as it may appear. Writing sections of the book during the COVID-19 pandemic and isolation gave Rebecca an opportunity to feel connected with Mildred. It's interesting because I, when I was writing the sections of the book that had to do with Mildred's incarceration and torture. 
and, and revising that section, that all happened during the pandemic. So I was quite isolated and sequestered in my, in my office in Brooklyn. And every day, every hour of the day, every minute of the day, I've, I felt like I was um, in, in a sense sort of in Mildred's cell with her. <laughs> and I tried to imagine what that was like. There's no primary source documentation of this, um, that period, that three and a half month period, because she was prohibited from writing anything and, and there are no reports that have survived. So I am left to fill in the picture with the primary source documentation, like the, the Kassib or the notes and, and testimony and so forth from her co-conspirators, and I'm left to sort of conjecture what Mildred's experience was. Uh, and also later, she was given a cellmate, Gertrude Clapworth, and she wrote two letters um, that described in detail what prison life was like with Mildred in that cell. So I know what her life was like then um, for that month that she had a cellmate in between her first and second trial. The book paints an extremely rich picture of snippets of Mildred's everyday life, which really transport you to the time and place. And you can really feel how much work and thought must have gone into writing it. But here I am in Brooklyn, uh, sequestered in my in my study um, during the pandemic, and and it was a very uh, an emotionally intense period for me. And I found myself going to sleep and just thinking about her experience. And in the middle of the night, sometimes I'd wake up with a sentence in my head, sort of floating there, and I would grab my phone and dictate it as a voice memo and. Sometimes I'd wake up the next morning and listen and I'd think, oh, that's such a great idea. And sometimes I would listen and it's complete gibberish. <laughs> but this is to say that I was, I was, you know, uh, absolutely, um, I think, immersed in the story of her incarceration and, and all that followed. And in some ways, I wouldn't want it any other way. It was a way of me getting extremely close to that part of the story without any distractions. Sometimes the reality of the subject matter just got a bit too much. But of course, you know, it's, it's emotionally draining. And I mean, sometimes I just had to stop, especially when I got to the sections where she, the dissection section, uh, where Mildred was dissected and the women in her group as well. And also when I followed Gertrude Clapeth to the Ravensbrück concentration camp, and I did a, a great deal of research on her. And I described, um, there's this wonderful book, Sarah Helm's book about Ravensbrück that was very useful to me in understanding the day-to-day -day life of women who were incarcerated there. And some of the descriptions that are in the book about that experience too, are just so horrific, but so important for people to understand and to not avert their eyes from, I think. We really need to know what happened. I do believe that we need a history lesson. While Rebecca's book is structured around Mildred and her life, there is a large cast of other characters who you also get to learn a lot about. I feel that I it was incumbent upon me to sort of bring this information forward in the context of Mildred Harnock. So yes, she's a family member of mine. And I think that that personal connection may have motivated me all the more. I mean, I think even, I mean, I'm, I'm interested in all the stories of, of the people in this book. I'm tremendously interested and very passionate about my desire to tell their stories and to uh, make sure that they are remembered, that their acts of heroism were not, committed in vain. And I believe that they were not. Um, I fervently believe that. Um, but I do, I think that the fact that Mildred is my great, great aunt maybe gave me just even a little extra motivation uh, because there was, I have this connection with somebody who I have heard about um, for most of my life in my family. And I feel, you know, all the more impassioned about telling her story. Another great feature of the book which helps bring the history to life are the photographs of primary materials Rebecca located. One of them is particularly poignant and was the inspiration for the book's title. There are a number of primary source documents and um, artifacts that I discovered in archives and, and in other places as I was researching this book. And I think one of the most powerful was the book that Mildred was 
translating in prison uh, shortly before her execution. It was a volume of Goethe poetry, and she spent the last hours of her life translating these poems and scribbling um, with a pencil stub in the margins of, of this book. Uh, the prison chaplain, his name was Harold Pulschau, was a secret member of the resistance, and he came in to um, basically give her spiritual counsel, as he did with other condemned prisoners. And he wrote about this in his memoir. And so this is why we know about the book and about what she was doing. And she was bent over the book. And after he left, uh, he smuggled the book out. And this is why we have this book today. And the, the title of my book, All the Frequent Troubles of Our Days, is a line from one of the poems that Mildred Harnock translated. So I actually feature a scan of that, a photograph of that page of the book um, in my book so that readers can see her handwriting and in a sense sort of be there with her in her prison cell imaginatively. That concludes our double podcast episode about Mildred Fish Harnack. If you want to learn more about her life, definitely get yourself a copy of Rebecca's book, All the Frequent Troubles of Our Days. Link to grab it from an independent bookstore in the show notes. Also in the show notes is a link to the webpage for this episode, where we've got sources for everything we've spoken about, a transcript, photos and more. Before we go, just a reminder that this podcast is only possible because of support from you, our listeners, on Patreon. So if you can, please consider joining us at patreon.com slash workingclasshistory, link in the show notes. In return for your support, you get early access to content, as well as exclusive bonus content, discounted books, merch, and more. If you can't support us right now, absolutely no worries. Please just share a link to our episodes on social media and give us a five-star review on your favorite podcast app like Apple or Spotify. Huge thanks to all of our existing Patreon supporters for enabling us to make this podcast. Special thanks to Connor Canazzi, Shay, James, Ariel Joya, Stone Lawson, and Fernando Lopez Ojeda. Music used in these episodes is Bella Chow, courtesy of Disky del Sole. Links to buy and stream it in the show notes. This episode was edited by Jesse French. Thanks for listening. Catch you next time.